Uh, we also have been pioneering and exploring um, video art and electronic arts. In fact, the museum was the first one to bring um, a, uh, a fully um, video-focused um, U.S. pavilion to the Venice Biennale with, um, were you there? No, I was in New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but um, uh, Bill Viola was the, was the U.S. artist, and I believe that was 92? something like that. Anyway, early 90s, really one of the very first um, to do that. And since then, they've been building with the um, curatorial support of John Spiak, a very interesting series of short experimental films that's been going on. And we're continuing that. In fact, uh, for the four days before the election, we'll be showing um, Anthony Montadas and Marshall Reese's political advertisement, which is a really a phenomenal collection of um, political advertisements, presidential um, election advertisements. No commentary, just the ads, starting with Eisenhower and ending up with the Romney-Obama um, pieces. And it's a, really, it's an elegant uh, history of the contours of how visual literacy and manipulation have developed since the 50s. So there's that whole tradition of um, the video and uh, electronic arts. And then really more recently, and very much something I've been pushing since I've, I've only been there two years, but since I've been there and before that, is the idea of what we call social practice, relational aesthetics, um, artists engaged with um, uh, communities, with, uh, with people, with, um, with groups in one form or another, exploring, examining, and understanding um, issues, but really working in a social context um, as they develop their work and pursue their research. And um, what I really like to do is I like to think about the the relationship of a museum as primarily a laboratory. It's an extraordinary institution, a museum, in many ways. Um, and one thing it really truly is, is a laboratory, a place for intensive investigation, exploration of ideas, the, um, the manipulation and combination. I mean, it's almost a time warp laboratory, if you think about it, because so much of what happens with the archive is the ability to go back and rework things from the past, but, you know, represent them so that they reveal things about us today. So I see the museum very much as a lab, as a working place, and very much in this post-disciplinary era that we are in, one that requires a combination of, of intellectual and scientific and artistic histories and um, disciplines to come together in their investigation. Another thing that a museum is, is it's a it's a really safe place. It's an interesting um, experience walking into a museum. It's very different from walking into a train station or a bookstore or almost anything else. Um, because there is this sort of suspension of what we know and an openness to what we will learn as you go into a museum. It's got this sort of bit of a, a hush of, of uh, sort of the, the thought process and, and there is a sort of a suspension of, of, of presumptions and utilities as you walk into a museum. Um, so there's that quality to it. And um, it's also very much a place, a gathering place, a meeting place. I think of it as a <clears throat> sort of a Greek agora or a um, piazza in an Italian town or a place where there is a chance for a flow of ideas, a combination of ideas and conversation. So all of these active qualities of what a museum is, is very much part of what we try to um, advance by um, bringing artists in, supporting them, and allowing them to develop projects using the museum more as a, um, as a launching pad or a laboratory or a starting point than as the sort of gallery goal. Um, the, being an art museum uh, is, adds yet another dimension because the, the art itself, in my opinion, is really one of the most complex ways of knowing. The, one of the things that you think about when you have any experience with the arts, and that can be music theater as well as painting and sculpture and so forth, is truly the, <clears throat> the nature of the dialogue you have with the object and 
what the our maker has had with the object. In effect, um, a painting is incomplete if it's not being viewed. There is a a participation uh, in terms of the conversation that takes place between the viewer and the painting as much and it completes what was what was there between the maker and the painter and the painting. And so it is this idea of dialogue and discussion that takes place with the arts that um, includes two parties at, the, at a very minimum. And as we all know in, in real life, as soon as you do that, you have an argument, you have a discussion. There is plenty of room for ambiguity and, and, um, and disagreement. <clears throat> and that ambiguity allows for uh, a very complex way of understanding something because if you have anything that's absolutely precise the way um, a mathematical formula can be, there really is one way of knowing things. As soon as you allow it to be a statement or a conversation or a sentence, there's much more ambiguity available. That doesn't mean there's a lot of very clear knowledge to be gained. So the type of knowledge that's available through artistic research is um, perhaps in some ways imprecise, but far more nuanced, complex, and, um, and in, engulfing than any particular scientific uh, axiom. And it's that nature of the complexity of, understa of understanding that's available through art that allows artistic research to really provide all of us with in many ways, <clears throat> breakthrough um, interpretations and breakthrough understandings of issues that we're ex exploring. And that brings me to another core element of the arts. The arts are absolutely a area of understanding that is, that permits challenges to the status quo. Uh, there are you know, every society has arts in one form or another, and the reason for that is not um, human beings' love of beautiful things. It really is the fact that as an organism, as a social organism, a cultural group, a society, needs to sort of continue itself through time. And to do that, it needs to address the changes, and there's always tons of changes. I mean, just the growth of the population itself can be one, but there are the ability to adapt to change is an essential in ingredient for any successful social form. And any power structure, any hierarchical system whatsoever, obviously is not in favor of change. They're, you know, the top dogs like to stay there. So there is a rigidity that's built into the development of human social systems. And that rigidity obviously makes them very brittle and unsustainable in the face of imminent, permanent, and constant change. It's the arts and the ability of allowing the jester, the artist, the challenger of status quo that actually provides adaptability to this system. The artists are allowed to actually challenge, well, what if we didn't do it that way? And who makes you king? And how about this? And it is that ability to challenge assumptions that provides adaptability to the species and to the organism. So challenging assumptions is part of the arts. This ability to actually have very, very complex understandings of something that aren't limited to the precision of science, but can allow for a nuanced, flavorful, really complicated, but also very accurate and precise understanding of the world. So those two ingredients are essential. And, um, and the third is this coming back to the idea of a dialogue, of an artistic object actually being made by somebody to communicate to somebody else. So there is the implication of the other in a, a piece of art. And the, in many ways, what happens in the artistic gesture is the idea of trying to reach out to the very perimeters of what we know challenging the assumptions, really, really going out there to get as full a grasp of a complex interpretation or impression, and then bringing it back and through extraordinary discipline, the incredible discipline that goes into being an artist, using that to actually try to get that idea to somebody else. That in itself is a profound humanitarian gesture. It really does talk to all of us about the us about the fact that we're all in it together. So my starting point with the idea of what the arts do and what a museum and an art museum, especially an art museum on a university is, is that it really needs to underscore that 
We actually are making it up as we're going along. We really are trying to figure out what the hell is going on, and it's always changing, and the arts provide that. And um, we're all in it together. We are absolutely in this together. We are suspended. Everything that, anything of any significance ever made that's ever associated with humans are these giant, giant collaborative open projects like language, like scientific and cultural knowledge. Those are the sort of things, these are giant collaborative projects that we all add to in, in different ways all the time. It's a living mass of interconnection. That's what we're about, that's what we do, and that's how we work. So the artists, that the individuals that actually dive into that very complex reality, looking at challenging the assumptions, understanding the interconnection, to, uh, spending a lifetime working on the disciplined nuances of craft and skill. I mean, there's a great uh, um, observation that you can make. You know, if you are going through medical, if you, you know, if you're going through, uh, no, if you don't have a relationship with your musical instrument by the time you're 16, 17, 18, that's really quite deep and profound, you'll never get to Carnegie Hall. But you can always go out and become a brain surgeon. The amount of work and effort that goes into being a, a talented, uh, capable artist is work that starts very early and never stops. So the, the amount of thinking, the amount of discipline, the amount of effort in being in this very, very crucial position to provide us with new ways, complex ways of looking at the world around us and the us in that world is something that uh, really needs the respect and support of institutions. So one of the things that we do at the ASU Art Museum is really provide these uh, significant practitioners in our society with the room to work, a supportive environment, and above all the respect and understanding that they themselves will figure out what's going on. We're not going to, as curators or as museum directors, decide what is going to come out of this. We actually are here to support that work, to support their work, and allow and understand that their work is research, is exploration, is unpredictable, and it will be coming together, made up as they go along, and I can assure you it will include us and make sure that we all know we're in it together. So that's sort of how I see a museum, that's how I see an art museum, and I an art museum connected to the, really, it's right now the largest research university in the country. I use the museum very much as um, an articulation point between the different research centers that take place, activated by artists coming into the institution, allowing them to investigate what they're investigating, explore what they're interested in exploring, and have access to engineers, biologists, technologists, anthropologists, any number of different research centers at the university. So it's a very uh, exciting, uh, fruitful, and uh, complex um, petri dish for the museum, to have a museum like this on a university campus like that. And we bring in people like Claire and Matt to work on a project and give them plenty of room to do it explore what they're doing, watch it change. In fact, I think the title of this uh, panel is Extinction, but even the concept of extinction might be extinct in this process at this point. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is it is a moving target, but it is constantly and solidly behind the same theme, and that is we are here together, we're in it, all of us in this together, and we're making it up as we go along, and we're doing the best we can. So with that in mind, how about if we talked a little bit about what you guys are up to? Man, I don't know if I can match that. Uh, <laughs> you should have had a, that second coffee. It's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we're, we're just both going to start and give you guys a quick context of our work, our past work, and to kind of you know, get you to the same foundation level that where we're coming from in our collaboration on this project called Rare Earth that is going to be opening in uh, February of 2013 at ASU Art Museum. And Claire and I have been working together and talking for almost a year now in this process, and we'll kind of speak about that artistic process, uh, how it's come about um, once we sort of uh, get done pitching our work. Pitching. I'm going to pitch my work right now. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Ready? So, um, 
My name is Matthew Moore, and uh, I am a farmer as well as an artist. And my, yeah, I'm Matthew. Good to meet you. <laughs> That's the best reception I've ever had. All right, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going to go downhill. <laughs> so, um, I'm the fourth. Uh, I'm a fourth generation farmer, but I will be the last generation to farm my family's land outside of Phoenix, Arizona, because of that. And. Um, my whole family, of course, is involved in this transition, and, and it's very complex. But I've, and because of that complexity and my inability to uh, successfully negotiate in the familial structures, uh, really laying this dialogue out, I've used art as a lens to look at this transition and really think about the greater impact, not just on my family's story, but starting there and then blowing out and looking at this global sort of situation that we have with this kind of transition and landscape. So this is my family's land, um, and it's outside Phoenix, Arizona, about 35 miles. And so you can sort of see we're in this last little pocket of agriculture in the, in the uh, Northwest Valley of Phoenix. And some of the first pro projects I did were really just trying to um, uh, put a spotlight on this transition specifically. And, and also there was, I don't even know who did this anymore. It's just crazy. Uh, I hoed that 950 foot by 450 foot floor plan out of a wheat field because I'm totally nuts. By hand? By hand. You was are it, nuts. Yeah, totally nuts. It wasn't aliens. <laughs> it wasn't aliens. No aliens involved. But I also was, it was interested in this, uh, the performative action of the farmer going out and clearing this land for this new transition and thinking about the futility of the labor, like the stone breakers from Corbea, you know, all that kind of historic art, art historic. But also I was looking at how the agricultural landscape was involved in this transition and you can't really stand on the front of your house as a farmer and be mad at developers. It's just because we're a part of that process. So I started to try and almost point fingers, if you will. The next project I did after my grandfather sold the uh, first uh, plot of property, I got, went to the city of Surprise and got the plat map, and then I GPSed it out on an adjacent field to where the development was. Grew the 253 homes next to this freeway. And, um, yeah, geez. Um, but I, at a certain point, I, 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 um, I think in this, what's going to be reflected more in Claire and I's uh, collaboration, and also I'm very inspired by what Gordon's talking about, is that you get to a point in your practice where you can point out problems, and we're really good at that, you know, and, and especially as artists, but that how, how is this involved in solutions, and how can you, you know, evolve your practice to sort of uh, create a, better, a bigger social dialogue that, that exists outside, the, you know, this sort of lexicon of, of art history and the one percent of our white walls and all that kind of stuff so one of the first projects I did was was thinking about sense of place and how to reconnect people to that and I did this thing called the urban transplanter which is this hundred foot long conveyor belt which uh, germinates and distributes little lettuce transplants out to this city this is in Pasadena California and it was up for about 14 months and we distributed I think 15,000 lettuce transplants and I don't know if they took those transplants out and grew marijuana in them afterwards because these little transplant pots we have are like perfect for that, but they never were on the ground. So it was a really amazing process of involving yourself in a community and getting them involved in that growing process, reactivating a lot, using all these sort of technologies that made it run independently of any power source or any water source or anything like that. But to, as a gesture, just to speak to the complexity of our food system, how separated we are with this over-mechanized system and how it distributes these beautiful little things that we watch for the next six months. Which made me think about why suburbia, especially in Phoenix, like if I knock you out in Phoenix and wake you up and not violently, but maybe in a very sort of like... If you go on and on yeah, and on yeah. in your conversation, you yeah. sleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in Wake You Up in Bakersfield, that you wouldn't know the difference and how we are formulating spaces that, um, that have that quality to them. They're everywhere, you know, and also nowhere at the same time. And what's the effect of that? And how, where does that disconnect start? How does the marketplace control that disconnect? And from a farmer's perspective, growing hundreds of acres of carrots, I've never seen my carrots in a grocery store. And I have no idea 
where they go, I don't know who gets them. And I, all I care is about the weight. And if they taste like crap, I'm sorry, but you can't find me anyways. And that's sort of the market structure that we've, which is the same thing as living in a suburban home, you know, in a strange way. So how I did this uh, project that's a bigger project and months of other stuff, I'm kind of jumping around, but this kind of speaks to that uh, problem solving almost lightly around uh, 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 extinction in a way, is the, to redesign this space even though she looks very happy there, um, uh, to connect people to the food and not talk about organic, conventional, just the, the raw basics, like your food grows in the ground, there's dirt involved, it's crazy, you know, and it takes time. So I formulated which now is the Digital Farm Collective, which is this uh, big organization that actually I started filming everything I grew for time-lapse uh, photography, and we're building these units to send out to farmers around the world to document their crops and collate that all in an in a online database that we can share the visual parts of it, but also the growing aspects of it in perpetuity and have this resource as farming and this farming knowledge goes by the wayside. And how did that be an articulation point, to use Gordon's word, for diversifying our plants that we're using or just the general growing knowledge and how that's being more specified and taken away from us in the smaller grower sense. And also to use it as a tool for consumer education. This is in Sundance in 2010 and we installed these films which were you walk up to go grab a, this is broccoli, head of broccoli and above is this short film that shows you how long it takes. It goes through, it's really beautiful. I'll play it still from another one. But um, at the end of it, the most important thing pops up is that, you know, broccoli, 160 days to harvest. So if you knew that it took 140 days to grow a carrot, how could that change the way that you relate to that and consume that? And think about that as a way of changing those problems that we have in resiliency and how we consume and whatnot. And a very, you know, beautiful, proactive way. And I'm unfortunately not Everything is planned from the position of the camera to give you the sense of each day passing with the shadow to reconnect you with those things that were so separated from them, those marketplaces and whatnot. But also to, the amazing thing is that kids loved it. They would sit there for 15 minutes in the produce section, which that whole thing is built for you to move in and move out and um, just loved it. And so how can we use the database as a tool for curriculum development? How can we you know, which all started in this artistic practice, coming from losing a family farm, and then coming all the way back to try and be a power for rejuvenation of that sort of loss, rather than focusing on the tragicness, easy, the easy sort of bucolic representation of the tragic the tragedy of losing that whole family lineage. Did sales of broccoli go up? What's that? Did the sale of broccoli go up? I don't know, actually. That's a really good question. We didn't. We only had it there for a week, and that's a really. So that's a synopsis of some of the work I've been working on. All right, and that probably took a lot longer than I was supposed to. So no, I apologize. Fine. So let's see. Here. You had 180 days. Yeah, that's right. 180 <laughs> days. So Claire, this is the navigations right here, and then you can kind of just go through and pick it, and they won't see you navigate. So it's kind of. But if I just want to go on to the next one, can I just press that? You don't that? become yeah. visible, but they can't see on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks. Claire Payne. Hi. Um, my name's Claire Patey, and I'm um, an artist and curator from London, in the UK. Um, and I suppose I do what I do because I guess that I feel like that we're living through a very particular time in history and that as we understand more about our impact on the world, um, that there's a big opportunities for people to collaborate, 
to participate and to develop empathy with one another. I think that's important. And I think that through an artistic process, um, we can really go to the heart of the um, questions, the heart of our, our values and our identity. And um, so what I do is I make uh, socially engaged work that um, brings together interdisciplinary teams of people. So I work across all disciplines. I work with e economists, scientists, artists, performers, doctors, um, and each project that I develop is different and will bring together a different community of people around a table to create that project. And um, most of my work is about creating social spaces in the public realm, normally outdoors, normally not in the context of a gallery space. Um, they're site-specific projects and they're about creating democratic spaces where people can come together and share conversation normally, well, often around food. So I guess that's a sort of common thread in um, is around, I guess for me, bringing together culture, bringing back together, reuniting culture, notions of culture and agriculture. And I think also food is a fantastic way in. It's a fantastic, it relates, everyone's got a relationship with food. Food um, is a great way into um, areas to do with emotion, to do with memory, to do with cultural heritage, um, and also a whole load of political issues, the relationship between the producer and the consumer, to do with health. It just covers a hell of a lot of areas. And also then there's a the social act of eating together. And I think that's an important thing. And it creates a space where people can speak and interact with one another. Um, I suppose another important part of what I, th I do is I think um, is about exploring this sort of relational aesthetic and giving the people who come to see the work agency so that they are active participants in the work and that their, their um, participation is as important as the artists or musicians or doctors or whoever's come together to make it. They are active, they are invited to create that work alongside the team. Um, I sort of work in two different ways. I'll just quickly show you a couple of projects. Um, one is very much about sort of the idea of invisibility and making the invisible visible again. And these are images from a television uh, program that I made for um, Channel 4 in the UK called Human Footprint, which was looking at an average British person's lifetime and what um, they produce and consume mainly consume, actually. And uh, it was from a really simple notion that um, through a conversation in a pub one night there was where someone said, imagine if you could see all the beer that you've ever drunk in your whole life, like laid out in front of you. <laughs> so we started making installations, and this is the 15,392 pints of milk that the average British person would consume in a lifetime. And the sort of idea is if, the, you, if you see it laid out, does that change your relationship with the notion of, of consumption. So if I just do that, that's... No? There you go. Um, this is, a, we had these kids that were a constant theme in the, in the show, but we paraded in front of them all the meat that you would eat in, a, in an average lifetime. I think it was seven, um, seven sheep. What do I do this? I can't, oh yeah, okay. And, that, and we blew up all the methane that you would fart in a lifetime. <laughs> That's that. um, this is a project I developed in collaboration with the climate change. I do work quite a lot of, of work around the environment, around climate change and cultural responses to climate change. <coughs> and I do work with um, a think tank, an economics think tank called the New Economics Foundation and a climate change scientist and a group of graphic designers. And we created a, um, a new ministry um, called the Ministry of Trying to Do Something About It and we published a contemporary one-month carbon ration book that would show you your fair share of CO2 usage, um, your global equitable share of CO2 usage. And it shows you inside, there's a whole load of coupons and it shows you um, what different activities that you might take part in in a month can um, use in terms of CO2. So whether you run a bath or you take a train or you buy a pair of socks, it's totally up to you what you do. But every time you do something, you take out the little coupon and you stick it on the back of the book. And when all 40 squares on the back of the book are full up, 
um, you, you, that's your ration gone. Um, so we asked people to try it as an experiment to look at how much they would need to change their behaviour for one month and um, it's quite drastic to try and live by it. Um, a lot of people lost a lot of weight. It's a good diet aid. But um, uh, also, I think it, it sort of highlighted things that I hadn't thought about before, like um, actually buying a pair of jeans was like almost a year's worth of rations because of the water involved and the energy involved in growing hot. Sorry. Sorry? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Your fault. I know. Um, yeah. How do I do that? Another project that I do um, annually is a project called Feast on the Bridge, which is for a festival in London called the Thames Festival. And we close one of the bridges over the River Thames and we lay out a table for 2,000 people to come and sit down and eat together. Um, yeah. And we work over the, over the year and people come together on one day in September and the bridge is transformed by a, a team of artists and designers and it's about reclaiming a public space that's normally got cars on it in the heart of the city. It's about sharing food and conversation. Uh, it's about taking part um, and it's about reconnecting with the growing cycle in the heart of a, a sort of urban context. And um, we do an outreach program. So um, this particular year we were growing heritage wheat varieties in allotments and community gardens and school gardens all over London. And we had more biodiversity in wheat in one area of South London than in the rest of, I think, Europe put together. Um, we create mobile gardens, quite often in supermarket trolleys, um, that we attach to bicycles. And um, different people create them during the year, and we bring them together on the bridge. Um, and someone made mobile gardens on hats that people could wear, and you could chop off a bit of the salad into your um, your dish when you're, you're eating. It's about having fun as well, it's about celebration. And although it deals with a lot of issues, I think humour and um, uh, optimism and ideas to do with celebration are really important because it's about looking at uh, another possibility for a way of living. Um, we collect food stories from Londoners. So we've collected over 5,000 food stories that then illustrated by an artist called Sophie Herxheimer and then we print those on the place settings on the tablecloths that go all the way down the bridge. So each place setting's got a different um, food story. Uh, it's very participatory. There's lots of things you can come and learn and learn through doing. I think that's a really important part of what I try and do too. So they're making corn dollies. I don't know, do you have corn dollies here? No. no. I mean, they're sure from the do. wheat that we grew anyway and they're a harvest sort of no, uh, at fertility symbol. We do. Um, you could learn how to thatch a roof, and we bought the um, all the wheat onto the bread bridge, and we um, threshed it and winnowed it and milled it, and you could bake bread in outdoor wood-fired ovens on the bridge. And then this wasn't a planned thing, but um, uh, I built an amphitheatre for for storytelling and poetry out of hay bales, straw bales. And I looked down back along the bridge and some kids were beginning to take it out. And, and I was like, no, no, please don't do that. Please. And I walked a little bit further. I looked around, there's 200 people throwing it at each other. And actually, I loved it. It's become a traditional thing. And it's about a, an urban population playing together and playing in the hay. And I think that's yeah. um, an unusual thing for people to come together and do. And it's great. Um, this is mayonnaise making, um, so you could learn to make mayonnaise and there were chickens on the bridge that had laid some of these eggs and we reckon that was probably the first time for a hundred years that an egg had been laid on a bridge in central London. And um, there's something about the alchemi al alchemical process of taking just an egg and some egg yolk and an olive oil and creating something else, this mayonnaise. Uh, butter churning, so there's cows on the bridge, you can have a go at milking a cow and learning that butter comes from milk, that comes from the cow, and actually you'd be surprised how many children don't know that. Uh, every year we have uh, participatory cake making, 
Um, so this is called the Beast on the Bridge and everyone decorates it and at four o'clock we wheel the whole thing out onto the bridge and everyone shares it. And there's something lovely about everyone creating something together that they're then going to share together. Sort of sacrificial in a way. Uh, we play traditional games, uh, make, making wine from locally um, grown grapes. Uh, there's an area in London called Tooting and we called it Chateau Tooting because many of the grapes had come from there. Um, and we carve pumpkins that we grow as well with school groups and they light the tables in the <coughs> evening. It looks really at the whole narrative from the soil to the growing to the harvest to the cooking to the sharing the meal and then we look at, uh, can we go on to the next one? Um, oh, sorry, we look at waste anyway, I was going to go on to that. This is a mobile toasting unit. They go round and you can make a toast to whoever you want and the, the, um, they celebrate that and uh, Oops, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you can go into that. This is waste. So we collect all the food waste from the tables. We have anaerobic digesters on the bridge. Um, and we have composting workshops, how to build a wormery. So we're looking at that going back to the soil, notion of going back to the soil. And, and that cyclical thing of soil back to soil. And then we look at waste within the food, uh, the food production chain as well. So this is all fruit that would be thrown away. It would have been in a skip. So we got the fruit from... Um, uh, supermarkets and wholesale markets that we're going to chuck it out and we opened something called the fruit rescue chop shop everyone came and chopped up the fruit and then 30 people or 50 people get round a tarpaulin and do a massive fruit salad toss and we share out um, the fruit salad so we look at, at the, the notion of waste as well and the value of something that's considered to have no value um, and I continue to work on that project um, as well as be developing this new piece of work with Matt. Gordon, Sorry, I probably went on too long as well. 